Last week, thousands of parents across the province pulled their kids out of school to protest Ontario's new health and physical education curriculum, which revamps what and when kids are taught about sex and sexual identity. Joining us now for more, Nadine Thornhill, sexuality educator, Michael Corrin, the author and journalist, and Ferris Marish, organizer of Parents of Ontario, a coalition against the sex ed curriculum. And we're happy to have you three here in our studio for this rather timely discussion, if I say so myself. Here's uh, some of what this is all about. Sheldon, you want to bring this up? Uh, health and physical education curriculum updates. This is not the whole thing, just some of the more controversial aspects. Grade three, for example, describing invisible differences, for example, gender identity and sexual orientation. Grade six, understanding of physical, social, and emotional changes during adolescence. For example, if a teacher is prompted, a teacher may respond thus, exploring one's body by touching or masturbating is something that many people do and find pleasurable. It is common and is not harmful and is one way of learning about your body. That's in it. Grade seven, importance of consent and discussions about delaying or abstaining from any genital contact, including vaginal, oral, or anal intercourse. Okay, these are some of the sort of more controversial aspects that have been discussed. Nadine, uh, what do you think is important about these changes? I think these changes are important for a few reasons. So in grade three, when we're talking about describing visible and invisible differences, I don't want people to get too caught up in the word describing. We're not going into, you know, gender identity theory or anything to... Just explain what that is. Gender identity theory would be, you know, talking about how their people may identify differently from the sex that they were assigned at birth. Basically what we're teaching kids is that, you know, there are different kinds of people in the world. You may be able to observe those differences or not, but regardless of whether someone is different from you or the same as you, these are all human beings and they all deserve to be treated with respect and so acceptance. Transgender, transsexual, all of these issues, that's not till grade eight from what I understand. That's not until grade, grade eight. Okay. Yeah. Ferris, to you next. Uh, what do you find problematic about what was just read out? The real problem is in the application of the theory. All what we read was beautiful and I think it's needed, but when it comes to describing it and I, I, I kind of differ with Nadine here because the way it's going to be, be presented it's not just going to be black and white it's not abstract and pure science these are children here when you present information to children you have to use tools you have to use visual aids you have to kind of convince them because they will be asking questions it's not just about you know the the body part is called such and such they want to know how it looks like where is it used what does it feel and and come I have an educational background and I know when dealing with children, it will never stop at just the words. They would want to know more, they would want to explore, they would want to feel. And that's the problem that I have with What is this. the problem with that? The problem is we're introducing them to uh, uh, exploration of, of sexual content, sexual ideas, uh, and even, you know, the, uh, when it comes to body parts in grade one. How are we going to teach this? And if we want to talk about, as it says in the, in the curriculum, we're going to say penis, <laughs> vagina, vulva. How is it going to be taught? You know, what kind of visual aids are they going to they going to be using in those classes? And if the kid uh, or the the student wants to know more, wants to explore more, how far are we going to go with it? Okay, Michael, your uh, issues with any of this? No, I, I would say one thing. That I, I'm sorry, but when you said all oh, this is beautiful, what was written? I've covered some of the demonstrations that have taken place, and I've been to the Facebook site. And you may think that, and I, I believe you, sir. But a lot of the people who are involved in this think that is vile. What was written up on that screen, they reject completely. How is it being taught? By teachers, by people who spend their lives with these children, loving them and caring for them. There is nothing intrusive here. A lot of this stuff the kids already know. A part of it's about protecting them from abuse so they can say, I was touched perhaps and it was wrong. Uh, these concepts, look, I don't want to be uh, too, too personal here, but you really think at the age of 11 and 12 that masturbation is unknown to them. We've been told by organizers of the campaign against all this that, that they're being instructed that is a total lie. They're being told it does occur. You don't have to be ashamed. Not encouraging you. We're saying it, it's common, it's real. Uh, we have been told that this is to try and indoctrinate people into homosexuality. Look, it's hard enough to get kids to do their math homework. I mean, but I mean, it's, seriously, there is, and I have to say this, the elephant in the room, there is a great deal of homophobia involved in this. I've seen it up front of what happens. Uh, there's a lot of personal animosity towards the, the, the Premier of Ontario, partly because of her sexuality. There's a lot of hysteria and misunderstanding. Um, and there are people also, and I've interviewed enough of them, who simply have not even looked at the curriculum. Sometimes, though, the sort of the, the, the notes from it that have been given out by people who are not being completely genuine. Okay, tons to unpack there. Let's see if we can do some of this. Ferris, uh, the issue of homophobia among people who believe as you do that 
this is not right. Uh, would you acknowledge there is some of that at play here? Um, the homophobia is not what we're looking at. There's a lot more uh, things to focus on. And he just brought up on grade six where they're talking about masturbation and exploring yourself, and it's not harmful. And you know, we claim, or the ministry claims, to have a lot of researches about behind this curriculum. And when I, I see a statement to grade six, and a teacher is telling them, you know, you can explore yourself, and it's not harmful. Well, we know there are a lot of researches that says uh, masturbation is harmful when it goes beyond a certain level. What guarantees you when you're Sorry, opening how? the door? It's it's psychologically harmful. It's an addiction. A kid that's going to start indulging in such activity. Do you think they're going to stop at masturbation, or they're yes. going to they're yes. going to they're going to they're going to well allow me to finish, please? Sorry. They're going to get even more and more charged and start see, becoming sex offenders. We have a case that happened in UK evidence? in November 24th. 2015, and a 13-year-old boy, after having that class in the UK, he went around and he asked one of his classmates to sleep with her. She said no. What do you think he did? He was courteous? No. He was charged up. He took her in an isolated place in school and he raped her. Although Wait, in I have, I can share with you that like article. Okay, the bottom line here. Bottom she line. did say no. Absolutely. I want to point out that she was trained to say no. However, because he was so charged, he did not listen to her no, and he raped her. Let me ask Nadine. Uh, that's an example he's putting yes. on the table. How frequently does that happen? Infrequently. So if we look at statistics, if we look at statistics put forth by the World Health Organization, if we look at statistics put forth by the Center for Disease Control, if we look, for, if we look at statistics put forth by agencies that study the effects of sexual education on a broad societal level, yes, of course, there are isolated incidents where there are people who still commit se sexual assault, who sexually abuse children, but if you look at it globally, the overwhelming majority of people who receive comprehensive sexual education delay sexual initiation. Unsupported. They have better sexual health outcomes, so we're seeing people are more likely to use contraception and practice safer sex when they're given that information. Do you think, though, I, I, I do see in the document that delaying sex mm -hmm. until you're yeah. ready for it mm -hmm. is one of the things yes. that teachers are permitted to Absolutely. say. Encouraged to. It's encouraged, encouraged yes. Uh, do kids actually do that? Yes. They do yes, delay. Yes, they do. They, based and, on the advice of adults. And based on the advice of adults and based on having all of the information. So I think that it's a misconception that if you introduce concepts of sexuality to youth that they will not stop. Those feelings you're talking about absolutely exist and they're very, they're very common and they're very normal. Mm -hmm. But not talking about it does not make those feelings go Ferris, away. let me follow up with you then. Would you acknowledge there is a difference between teaching about sex and promoting sex. Absolutely. And I don't think this is teaching because you have You think adults. this is promoting? This is promoting. Absolutely. I'll tell you why. Because there are adults that are not able to control themselves. There are adults that are indulging in this and they're not able to deal with it properly. Now you want to tell a grade six student that it's pleasurable. Go ahead and enjoy it. It's normal. Coming from a trusted source, which is the teacher. They won't find that and out? I, I would love, they will find that out, but I would love to imagine a classroom where the teacher is sitting down with 20, 30 kids, and we're talking about masturbation. There are resources that being, whether they're used or not right now, there are resources that are out there that we can, you know, we all receive in our emails that talks about using vegetables to try masturbation, or doing this, or do, what kind of a classroom would that be? Is that be? in the curriculum? It, no. It's no, not in the curriculum, but it's a resource that will be used. Did we all hear to you, uh, last year at TDSB? Is, this a is T fantasy. This is hysteria. Sir, at TDSB, there was a poster hung in one of the classrooms how to give a good oral sex. It was there for weeks before students noticed it and took it down. Don't tell me it's fantasy. Teachers, uh, okay. story, teachers if I, if I are biased right. and they will if go we that can, far. I want to make sure everybody's getting yeah. equal time here. Michael, please. I have to say this, um, the, the coalition of groups opposing this, that, 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 let's talk about who they are. I'm not attributing motive here, but people need to know uh, this is not a, a faith-based organization. The Roman Catholic Church has said we accept this curriculum uh, taught through a Catholic lens. The Anglican Church has said it's okay, United Church, many evangelicals. This is a right-wing fringe of the Catholic Church, uh, very conservative evangelicals and some Orthodox Muslims. I have to say this, and I mean no disrespect, but it's pretty rich when right-wing Catholics with a, a history recently still ongoing of abuse where kids did not have the resources to say no to people in authority are saying this is a bad thing. A lot of this is, is purely, I mean, it's, it's imagination, it's drunken hysteria. I, I, I don't understand the basis for it. The idea that, that one 
young person who commits a terrible crime was motivated by sex education. This curriculum is pretty standard in most of Europe, by All the right, way. Let me follow up with you on this, though, Michael. Um, the Avengers is a pretty uh, popular new movie that's just out right now. Uh, I've seen it, took my kids to it. Everything was hunky-dory as far as I was concerned. However, we do have to allow for the possibility that other parents may make different choices mm -hmm. because they think the content of the movie is too violent or whatever. This one-size-fits-all approach that the provincial government is bringing forward right now, would you acknowledge it's potentially problematic for all parents? I think there should have been more genuine consultation, and I think uh, the government was a bit disingenuous, uh, actually, in, in saying that it had. It's all been pushed into a stew of anger because of what has happened to one senior education minister. Uh, and there have been many accusations that this man uh, wrote the curriculum, which we know he didn't. It's yeah, the, yeah, we know who you're talking about, yeah, the I mean, former it, deputy minister. Right, I mean, it, his name was over posters, most of the demonstrators that I attended outside Queen's Park, and there were thousands of them. Uh, it's pretty standard fare, but I do wish the government had consulted more. But if, you, if parents actually knew what was in it and then reacted negatively, it would be different. But from my experience here, it's a reaction to what they think might be in it or what they're told is in it when it really <clears> isn't. <throat> or horror stories like we, we've just heard. Any form of education, some parents will feel they're not being completely represented. This is about the, the maturing of children though, and the safety of children. And if there's any motivating factor, it's actually to protect children from abuse. People have, and if they read it, they will see, we must listen to religious requirements. Um, the only way to guarantee not uh, b being a, a victim of sexually transmitted illness is by abstaining. This is all in there. It's not radical stuff. Nadine, let me ask you about this notion that one size fits all. There are some parents who don't want their kids to go to those movies because they think, my kid's not ready for this yet. Absolutely. And if you, if you read the curriculum, which I admit is a large and unwieldy document and it's not accessible to everyone, but in the beginning of the curriculum, it states explicitly that parents and families are the primary educators of their children and that it is up to parents and families to instill values, ethics, morals, religious beliefs. So I think it's also important when we're talking about the curriculum to acknowledge that it's not an either or. It's not public sexual health education or family-based sexual health education. I have my own principles and beliefs and ethics around sexuality as well, and when my son comes home from school, I am going to tell him about that. How old is he? He's eight years old. And I have no problem say, with him coming home and saying, you know what, I learned this in school, and saying to him, okay, well, you know what, in addition to that, here's what I would like you to understand from the moral ethical side. Here's what we believe in our family, and families can absolutely do that. I'd also like to point out that for the majority of the curriculum, the schools can make provisions if the family is absolutely against mm -hmm. them having this sort of instruction in school. Does that help you, Ferris, the notion that, that I think the government has now said, if you really, really, really object to this, you can just pull your kids from the class and they don't have to go? Well, in reality, if you really, really object to it or if they really respect people's values, let's make this an option. And we presented this to the Premier in our meeting. Make it an option. If you feel that people want to have this education, make it an optional education. But the problem is here, we have a lot of uh, parents well, basically that... basically is now, isn't it? It's not an option. Well, if you want to pull your kids, it's, it's an option. It's not an option because you're going to have to pull your kid out of class. And we have reported cases where kids were uh, humiliated because they were pulled out of class by their peers. So what are we doing well, here? How you know that? What? Well, because, sir, it seems like you're really not aware of what happens in classes. What happens in classes, they've been talking about this now for years. Mm. The curriculum now, it's making it official, but, sir, it has been actually yeah. presented well, now hold on. for I've put years. four kids through the education system, and first, we need mm. to say some things quite clearly here. Yeah. We live in a collective. We live in community with one another. Mm. If one group, the majority, knows about certain things and treats people with respect and the other doesn't, we have some issues. Part of this document is respecting particularly kids who may feel... And disrespecting uh, the others. And may feel uncomfortable in their gender, may have gay parents, two mums or two dads. It's talking about respect. Now, I would like to ask those people, the people who were demonstrating, who I was there and I spoke to many of them, do they actually teach sex ed at home? Do they teach their children to respect Absolutely. differences? Absolutely. Do they believe in sex education? What do they actually think about sex education? Absolutely. Sex Sir, you're, you're oh. trying to focus on... I may on, look dumb, on, but... You, you, you focus on homosexual issues. No, no. And you talk, it's One way off. beyond this. No, but it seems like all what you focus on in this, because it's way okay, beyond this. Us, can, I, can you address Michael's point, which is... Yes, we all agree this is, hang on, this, is, this is important information for people to know at some point in their Absolutely. lives. Absolutely. You can disagree when. Not all parents 
will teach this. Not all children feel comfortable getting this information from their parents. Yes. What do we do about that? Work with parents. Encourage parents. I've personally been working with parents for the past 12 years, talking about sexual education, talking about problems in school, talking, talking about bullying, talking about challenges, talking about accepting of others. Personally, I've reached out to hundreds and thousands of people to, to talk about this. Parents need to be uh, uh, engaged. What we're doing here is we're stripping that away from parents and putting it in the hand of teachers. By the way, they're not that trained to do this yet. They're making a lot of mistakes. Teachers are biased in some, I'm not saying all of them. Some, some of them are great, but we have biased teachers, not trained, and they're crossing a lot of boundaries. So can, can biased I, to their own inclinations and ideas. Nadine, May please? I address, I just want to address two things that you said. I completely agree with you that this is what I do as a sexuality educator. I work with parents and I work with teachers to educate them on how they can talk to their children. So I absolutely agree. I think what we also need to acknowledge is that as much as we can reach out for parents, we can't make them do it. As many parents as I talk to who are open to providing sexual education for their children, I meet the parents who are resistant to doing it, who don't want to do it. As many children are in wonderful homes with supportive parents, there are children who do not have supportive parents, who have abusive parents. I presume it works have. the other way too, which yes. is the kids don't want to learn it from and their the parents And the kids don't either. always want to learn it from their parents. There's also value in having those lessons reinforced at an institutional level. We're talking about things that don't just don't just affect people on an individual level. When we're talking about things like sexually transmitted infection rates, that's a public health issue. When we're talking about an epidemic <clears throat> of sexual assault and harassment because we have youth who have been taught that you can't talk about sex, you can't say these words, and then we put them in a situation where they're in a relationship and they're vulnerable and they're having their first sexual contact and we're saying, you need to start asking for consent and they can't do it because they've never talked about the, these the things. The issue of contraception, uh, quite a few of, the, of the, the, the composite groups in this coalition do not believe, and that's a perfect right in, in, in contraception. They thus don't want it taught or its availability in schools. Now, that is a fundamental, that's a self-evident aspect of, of any sex ed curriculum, both for safety and for power over procreation and so on. I know, I mean, it's absurd to deny this. There are many parents involved in this who say, we don't want that taught. Well, there you really do have this, this clash of culture because this is generally accepted by the vast majority of Canadians. And People, the state should prevail. Well, I don't think the state should prevail, but the state in public education has a right to educate children uh, to understand what it means to be part of, of, of Canadian society. Well, Nadine, how about you then? Does the curriculum leave room for religious and or cultural accommodation? These are things that are going to happen more in a, in a family and a personal context, but we do live in, in a province and a culture where you are not obligated to send your children to public school. Mm -hmm. um, you do have options. You have options of homeschooling. You have options of, of private school. Mm -hmm. um, I, will, I will acknowledge that private school is not always accessible from a financial standpoint, but there are other, there are other options. You have options of... Um, Supplementary education, so you know, after-school programs, um, programs outside of the school system. Okay, Ferris, you, you met with the premier, right? Eh? I did. You met face to face with Premier Wynne on this. I did. And you told her all of your concerns. Yes, we what did. What did she say to you? Well, uh, I'd like to first challenge that this is accepted by the majority of Canadians, and this is what I, one of the things that we suggested is, if you truly believe that it's accepted by the majority of Canadians, let's have an open and fair I survey. Said and I, well, the, in general, in general, everything. Okay, I mean, because I, I, that's don't, a, don't get too far away from my question here, which was, okay. which was, what did the premier say to you when you suggested um, to her you wanted to see some change? Yeah, what we asked for is we asked for a fair survey, fair consultation, and if it's truly accepted by the majority, then we'll have, you know, we'll, we'll accommodate it. So what happened is when we asked her first of all that our kids are being heard because they're being, you know. There's a conflict, as you mentioned, you know, with some beliefs and some values. She said, okay, take your kids out of class. He said, okay, but they're being bullied and being humiliated out of class. She said, put him back in class. And it does not, did not Did she indicate to you one way or another whether or not she was prepared to yield or no. change? she or said clearly she will not withdraw. We asked for withdrawal. She said she will not withdraw. When we asked why, she said because we've worked on this for five years. And our, our, our answer to that was, okay, since 2010 to now, how come there was no proper consultation? Well, well, she would deny that, of course. She says that there's never been more consultation well, on this issue in Ontario history. I, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's her word against our word. Let, let's prove it. We talked to a lot of trustees. They said never heard about it. We talked to a lot of parents. Mm -hmm. When they say 4,000 parents from 4,000 oh, uh, 4, parents representing 2 million students, is that a fair consultation? 
And one more point was actually clear. When they were consulted, the information were not presented properly. So the details were not presented mm -hmm. to parents. The questions were so vague, like, would you like to protect your kids from, from cyberbullying? Sure, I would. Someone's word against someone so, else. So We've got a minute I, and a half to go, Mike. As for the bullying accusation, uh, now, I can understand if one or two children are out of class, others might say, why weren't you there? When these young people were put out of class recently, they were the majority. So you're telling me that the majority are being bullied by the minority. There is a lot of smoke, uh, uh, sort of a fog around what is going on here. People need to look, now it is a long curriculum, and most of it is very boring. You know, the interesting stuff, if you like, there's not that much of it, but if people actually read it, they don't react, but they, they reason, they stop listening to people who are just being dishonest about the thing. And we need to ask fundamental questions. Do we believe in, in notions of equality? Do we believe in gender equality? What do you think they should do, their group? I think it's very difficult, but I think they should get a, a new leadership very quickly. I think they should listen to some of the, the church leaders who are being very responsible about this. They don't speak even for a majority within Christian and Muslim faith. They, they, they speak to a politicized group that's being used in some ways, I'm sorry, but being used in some ways for political reasons by some leaders. I've seen it happen many times before, and, and, and it's, it's a strange coalition. I, I was even personally denounced by an, an office Presley impersonator at the demonstration, so it is a very odd coalition. Uh, in our last 30 seconds, Ferris, if if the Premier sticks to her guns, what do you do then? We're just going to keep fighting. I mean, we're going to uh, uh, reject it. We're going to uh, protest. We're going to do. We, we live in a democratic society, <laughs> and part of democracy is consulting with people, especially to sensitive that will affect minorities. We're talking about protecting minorities, and it seems like we're hurting a lot of minorities here. So, if it's truly about protecting minorities, let's play it fair. Let's play a Canadian game of listening to everybody and finding a solution. Part and I'm pretty sure that we will be able to find. Part of one. democracy is electing legislators to make decisions, and once the decision is made. You know, you, you get them unelected if you want to change the if, decision. If it's only if it's a couple of years in to change that, we will wait those couple okay. of years and we'll change it. Nadine Thornhill, Michael Corrin, Ferris Marish. Good of you all to come into TVO tonight for this Thank debate. You. Much appreciated. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supportTVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.